Okay, so today we're going to be covering the historical books, but I want to go over this chart every week. Now, these are the 39 books of the Old Testament. So we went over the Pentateuch, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and then the historical books. So the Pentateuch is five. The historical books are 12, which is Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Now, poetry and wisdom, these are also five. Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. And now the major prophets, which we're going to cover today, are five, which is Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And then the minor prophets are 12. So the Pentateuch, five. The historical books are 12. Poetry and Wisdom, five. Major prophets, five. Minor prophets, 12. So that's a good way to remember it if you are good on math. So now the major prophets, they're major because of their message of, or quality, but rather because of their length of books. So we call them major prophets and minor prophets. So not that one was more important than the other, but they wrote longer books. And that's why the only reason why they call them major prophets. And we read already these five major prophets and, and their books are, are big. They got a lot of chapters in those books. But what is a prophet for those of you who don't know? The word prophet in the Hebrew is nabi, from a root meaning to bubble forth as from a fountain or hence to utter. And the prophets at that time in the Old Testament, they felt a, a bubbling forth in their spirit and they had to give the word of the Lord. And that even happens today when we're in a service and someone might have a word of God bubbling in their spirit that they need to share. So that's the root word of a prophet, a bubbling forth in your spirit. So it's important for us to know. Thus a prophet was a spokesman for God. He spoke in God's name and by his authority. He is the mouth by which God speaks to men. And hence, what the prophet says is not of men, but of God. Prophets were the immediate organs of God for the communication of his mind and will to men. So in the Old Testament, God has always had his prophets or his preachers, if you want to use that word. But he had his prophets always you know, sharing with the people of God. God always had a people. So prophets were the mouthpiece of God. If you wanted to inquire anything about God, what was the will of God in this situation or in that situation, you would go to a prophet and the prophet would tell you. And, and if you read First Samuel, Saul lost his donkeys and they said, why don't you go to the prophet Samuel and he'll tell you where the donkeys are. And when Saul went over there, he got more than the donkeys. He was anointed as the first king of Israel. So that's what the prophets were in the Old Testament. Now, there were other prophets besides the major and minor prophets. They're, those are the only ones that wrote prophetic books. But there were other prophets in the Old Testament, like Abel. You know, these are other prophets. And I put the scripture reference there so that you can look that up on your own. Abel was considered a prophet. Enoch and his prophecies in Jude, chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Abraham, Miriam. Now, a female prophet was called a prophetess. Moses, Samuel, David, Nathan, Deborah, Elijah, Elisha, and Huda. And there were other unnamed prophets. So we see that God always had prophets speaking to his people, you know, all the way from, from Genesis. So, but these prophets that I mentioned here, Abel, uh, Abraham, they didn't write no prophetic books. And that's why, you know, we're not going to cover them. So the major prophets. They brought God's word, which included warnings of judgment, warnings and hope for the immediate future, warnings and hope for the distant future, hope in the coming Messiah. So prophecies are basically predictions. The first book is Isaiah. You're going to cover the, the prophet Isaiah. He proph prophecy and judgment. Where did he prophesy? In Judah, 701 to 681 BC. To convince the people that salvation was possible through repentance and hope in the coming Messiah. The outline is condemnation, 1 to 39, comfort in exile, 40 to 55, and future hope, 55 to 66. So we see that there's 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. The Judean kings reigning during Isaiah's ministry were Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And that's important for you to know because when you read 1 Kings and 2 Kings, these are the kings that were 
ruling at that time that Isaiah the prophet was prophesying. So it will help you put these prophets in their historical setting. So I know that they're separate in terms of the way they are listed in our Bibles. You know, you have the major prophets and then all the minor prophets. But as we go through them, you're able to place them in their historical setting, that they were just not prophesying isolated. They were actually speaking to the people of, of Judah and to the kings. The historical purpose, to record God's prophecies concerning Judah and Jerusalem, to record God's judgment of the nations and his triumph over the world, to record God's warning to his people, to document the reign of Hezekiah and his deliverance from Assyria, showing how his reign marked a shift from the threat of Assyria to the captivity of Judah by Babylon, to record God's prophecies concerning Israel's deliverance, comfort, and glorious future. So as you start reading the book of Isaiah, you're going to see that there's a lot of prophecies and predictions there. So the prophets would start by, and the word of the Lord came to me. If you're reading the King James Version, it should say, thus saith the Lord. But we all know that, you know, God doesn't speak that way. That's just the way they translated 300 years ago in England. So the word of the Lord came to me. That, that's, you'll hear that phrase over and over again. And then they speak whatever God gave them. Now the doctrine or spiritual purpose of Isaiah to call God's people back to salvation and faithfulness. So throughout the history of Israel, God had always had prophets calling the people back into a relationship with him. God never abandoned them completely because his desire is always for relationship. He created us in his image and in his likeness. So as you read the prophets, you're going to see that God was always calling them back to himself. To prophesy of the coming Messiah, there's a lot of messianic prophecies in the book of Isaiah to warn other nations of the futility of trying to stand against the sovereign Lord to illustrate to illustrate through the life of Hezekiah the tremendous delivering power of the Lord no matter what the circumstances are and then the Christological Christ center purpose prophecies concerning Christ are more clearly seen in the book of Isaiah than in any other Old Testament book except for Psalms. And we read that last week, the Messianic Psalms. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, what else? That they betrayed him for my own friend. He who took bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. You know, they pierced my hands and my side. That was all in the book of Psalms that we covered last week. So those are called Messianic Psalms. But Isaiah foresaw at least 20 prophecies about the Messiah. And Isaiah 53 is one of the most compelling prophecies about Jesus Christ. You know, it's good to read Isaiah 53. But the key verse in Isaiah is Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. But to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And this is, again, a prophecy about the Messiah or of Jesus Christ. Isaiah for seeing the future by the spirit of the living God. And a lot of times they did not even know what they were prophesying about. You know, first Peter says that they were prophesying, wanting to know what time and all these events were going to happen, but they were under the influence of the Holy spirit. And they were just prophesying and writing down what God had given them. So we see the prophet Isaiah and then Jeremiah. What is it about prophecy and judgment? We're in Judah 626 to 582. BC to warn Judah of their destruction, to remind them of their sin and convince them to submit to the Babylonian invaders. Now this is Jeremiah the prophet. Now remember the northern kingdom had already been taken captive by Assyria and Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. So now Judah is left. It's in the south and their capital is Jerusalem. So Jeremiah is telling them to surrender you know, to the king of Babylon, and, and you'll live and, and go with them. God is sending you to exile for 70 years. And Hezekiah the king didn't listen to that prophecy. And what happened was that they took Hezekiah, the king of Babylon, plucked out his own eyes and killed his sons. He should have listened to Jeremiah. He said, you will live if you go with him. You know, this is a part of the plan of God because of your disobedience. Go with them and you will come back to the land. Hezekiah did not listen so Judah had been thoroughly corrupted by the evil reign of King Manasseh. Now Manasseh was one of the most corrupt kings that Israel had. And then, and then only outwardly affected by the reforms of King Josiah. Now Josiah was a good king, 
And he tried to bring reform and bring the word of God back to the people, but that only lasted a short time. As soon as Josiah died, everybody went back to their old ways. The people have failed to sincerely repent and turn back to God. They are described as completely apostate and backslidden, utterly depraved and immoral, even excelling in, in wise in doing evil. They were guilty of numerous and horrific sins, among them idolatry, insincere worship, injustice, sexual immorality, including temple prostitution, and even child sacrifice. Now, the nations around them used to practice child sacrifice. They used to sacrifice their, their babies to this false god named Molech, which was an idol made of metal. And they would put that, and their hands extended out, and they would put fire behind them and then put their child in the hands of the god Molech and sacrifice them to them. So here the children of Israel and Judah are practicing the same things that God told them, don't do these things. And because of these things, you're going to be exiled. You're going to, I'm going to remove you from your land. That these sins were denounced by Jeremiah so fervently and for so long, over 40 years, Jeremiah is warning them. And that the warnings and judgment pronounced were so harsh, suggest that these sins were not occasional or being committed by only a few. So for 40 years, Jeremiah is warning them. And that's one of the things I love about God, that he's slow to anger and abundant in mercy and grace. God gives chance time and time and time and time again. There is no being as patient as God. In the days of Noah, he waited 120 years while Noah was building the ark. Noah, in the New Testament, in 1 Peter, he's called a preacher of righteousness. So picture Noah building the ark, and for 120 years, God is having mercy and calling people to repent. Come into the ark. There's going to be a flood coming. You know, turn away from your sins. If you come into the ark, you're going to be saved. God always gives people opportunity and chances. So for 40 years, Jeremiah is calling them back. And this is the outline of Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah 1 to 10 is his calling. It says, even before you were in your mother's womb, I call you to be a prophet. And then prophetic warnings, 11 to 28. New covenant, 29 and 39. The fall of Jerusalem, 40 to 52. The historical purpose of Jeremiah, to arouse the people of Judah to repent of their sins and to warn them of coming judgment, to turn the hearts of God's children, his beloved sons and daughters, away from lifeless idols and back to himself their loving creator. The prophecies of Jeremiah contain God's final warnings to Judah just prior to the fall of Jerusalem and exile to Babylon. If Judah did not repent, the nation will be utterly destroyed. Despite the Lord's enduring patience and his longing to show his people mercy, their sin had become so ingrained and their hearts too hard to heed God's warning. Jeremiah calling out to them, repent and God will extend mercy and grace. The doctrinal spiritual purpose. What can we learn spiritually by reading the book of Jeremiah? The Lord God is creator of all and rules over all na nature, people, and nations. He is intimately and profoundly involved in this world in the lives of those who trust him. Just think how important this message is to the believers today. No matter how ba bad things get, no matter how devastating our personal situation may seem, our gracious and all-powerful Lord is full of, is full of control. So God is in control. He was telling Judah to repent, to turn to him. And then once they didn't repent, he said, you're going to be in Babylon for 70 years. And they were in Babylon exactly for 70 years. After a while, God told Jeremiah, tell them to surrender to them. This is my will. They didn't want to surrender. So the Babylonian besieged Jerusalem, which basically a besiege is that the whole army of, of Babylon encamps all around the city. And the city at that time was all made of wall. So they almost trapped in the wall. And, and, and eventually they started eating, you know, their babies and all. That's how bad it got. He was there for like a year and a half. King Nebuchadnezzar beseeching the city and just waiting for them to come out. If they were to listen to Jeremiah and just go with them, this is according to the plan of God. And I just want you to notice how God uses nations. Because at this time he used the Babylonians, who was a wicked and sinful nation, he used the Babylonians to come and judge Israel and take them captive. So God is in charge and in control of all nations, not only the church, not only his plan with the Jews. God is in charge of all nations. The Bible says the king's heart is in the hands of the Lord, and he turns it wherever he wants. 
the Christological Christ center purpose to declare the promise of the new covenant in Christ, which is God's law written in our hearts and in our minds. That's in Jeremiah 31, saying that one day the new covenant is going to come. That covenant means an agreement. A new agreement is going to come with Christ that he's going to write his laws in our hearts and in our minds. And that's when we come to Christ and we get saved, all of a sudden we're thinking about God all the time. His word is in our hearts and in our minds. And to declare the promised Messiah, the coming of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, our righteousness. That's in Jeremiah 33, 14 to 26. So there, the Lord is our righteousness. Again, predictions of our Christ. The key verse, and a lot of people love to use this verse, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Now, this is Jeremiah speaking to the children of Israel, to Judah that's gonna, about to go into exile for 70 years. God is still encouraging them, saying, I have a plan for you, declares the Lord, to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. Even though you're going into exile, that does not cancel out my plan, you know, because God always has to judge sin, but his mercy triumphs always over judgment. You know, mercy is, is always better than, than sacrifice. And then Lamentations, this is another book, who wrote it, Jeremiah. And it's basically a poem, and it's uh, Jeremiah lamenting or crying, where in Babylon in 586 B.C. to express the despair of the people of Judah over the loss of their land city and temple. So there's a lot of agony in Jeremiah's heart, you know, weeping and lamenting, you know, over Jerusalem and the people of God. Sorrows of the captive, anger with Jerusalem, hope and mercy, punishment and restoration. And here you have a picture of Jeremiah among the ruins of Jerusalem. And he's just lamenting, you know, how can this happen to the people of God that had the law of God, that had the prophets of God, Anytime they wanted to inquire anything about God, all they had to do was go to a prophet. And the prophet would tell them, this is the will for you. This is what you need to do. And the prophet would prophesy. That's all they needed to do. But they've allowed the nations around them to influence them. And God had called them to be a holy people. And when God gave the Israelites the whole land of Canaan, he told them, I'm giving you this land because the people that are there are corrupt. They, they were practicing, you know, a lot of abominable things, you know, and, and sinful things. He said, I'm removing them because of this. But if you commit the same things, I will also remove you from the land. So we see that God's judgment against sin is real and his mercy is also real. So sometimes we, we just focus on the mercy of God and the grace of God and, and the love of God and, and almost like a pushover. But we forget about the justice of God and the judgment of God. You know, and God, you know, has to bring punishment, you know, to sin. That's just his nature. He can't allow sin to just run rampant without, you know, punishment. The historical purpose of lamentation. Lamentation is chiefly a bitter cry of despair over the utter destruction of Jerusalem, the writer's beloved city. It records in detail the terrible events that took place so that all Israel might remember that God is true to his word and will severely judge sin. Several sections serve as prayers for, of repentance and sorrow for sin, as well as pleas for God's mercy. So there's prayers there, you know, repentance. That's uh, Jeremiah as a prophet, having the heart of God and praying for the people to, to, to turn back to God. But it also shows that God is true to his word. Blessings for obedience, discipline or punishment for disobedience. God is the same way, both. He'll bless you if you're obedient. If there's disobedience, there's always consequences for disobedience and sin, always. No one ever gets away, you know, with sin in the eyes of God. They might get away with it down here on this earth and fool and deceive people, but we all must stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible says it is destined for a person to die once, and after that, the judgment. Everyone will be judged before God. We're all accountable to Almighty God. So yes, people might get away with horrific sins here on the earth, but they will face God in the day of judgment. And no sin will go unpunished unless that person on the earth repented of their sins and turned to God and received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. There's only one way for salvation, and that's through Jesus Christ. Yet in spite of the obvious misery and anguish, 
Jeremiah's lament also reminded the Jewish exiles of God's faithfulness to his word and his covenant promises. God's judgment will not endure forever and his compassion will not fail. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. So there's a double thing going on here. The judgment because of sin and they're going into Babylon. They're going into exile for 70 years. But again, God's mercy and grace continues to draw them back. The doctrinal spiritual purpose as a whole lamentation reveals both the judgment and mercy of God. It depicts God's faithfulness to his word that he would judge sin and those who refuse to repent. It also declares God's steadfast love for his people. There's always two sides of God, the judgment of God, the justice of God, and the mercy of God and the love of God. And God leans more towards mercy and love and forgiveness. That is his desire all the time until people leave him with no other remedy than to bring judgment. But that's not God's first, you know, reaction to bring judgment and punish somebody. Like some people growing up, they grow up thinking that God is an angry God and can't wait to punish people, you know, and send them to hell. That's not who God is. He gives chance after chance after chance until the person just doesn't want to repent, doesn't want to listen, and then it leaves God no other option but to discipline that nation or that person again for their own good so that they can come back to him. And many who are listening to me right now have known when you've turned away from the Lord, things don't go well. When you know you 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 might have drifted from the Lord or, or left the church, you know, for, for many years, things don't go well when we turn away from the Lord. When we're walking right with God, the blessing of God is upon our lives. So it's important. And the Christological Christ Center purpose. As with all of Holy Scripture, Christ is at the heart of lamentation. His spirit and message infuse every page. On this side of the cross, we must read lamentations in view of Christ's life and coming kingdom. It was his suffering, death, and resurrection that redeemed us and made us possible for God at, at world's end to wipe away all tears. So Jeremiah is a type of Christ that he's lamenting his people going into exile and the sins and the destruction of Jerusalem crying out. And he's a type of Christ because the Bible says that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. And then in revelation it says that when God's new heaven and new earth comes, he's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. So God also laments, you know, when people are not doing the right thing and are not walking right with him. The Bible also says that God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Now, that's profound because we think that when a wicked person dies, that God rejoices and says, good for him. You know, let him go to hell. It says he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. The, the wicked, they choose their own path. God has all given us a free will. And that's what we have to understand, that people do what they do because they have a freedom to choose evil instead of good. But God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God's desire is for all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God's desire is for us to repent and the whole world to turn to him. But he is given people free will. They have to choose to receive Christ or reject Christ. So we see that God laments, you know, he cries out and that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And that's when John 3, 16 becomes so impactful to the believer's life because it says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, that word believe in the Greek means to commit. Whoever commits in, to Christ shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You know that if God in his mercy and love did not send Christ, his only begotten son, to die on the cross, we would have all been doomed and we would have all died and ended up in a place called hell. Nothing obligated God to send his only son to die for our sins. Remember, God is God all by himself. He is self-sufficient. God does not need anything. He's God all by himself. He created us out of his good pleasure, but he didn't have to create us. He sent his son to die on the cross because of the love that he had for humanity for human beings, because human beings are the only ones that are created in the image of God. Only a God-centered gospel, only a, a, a philosophy that has God or, or a worldview that has God 
gives value to human beings because we're creating the image of God. God in, in the word says that we are valuable. Why? Because we're creating his image and his likeness. No other thing he created is in his image and likeness. None of the animals, none of the birds, none of the, the, the sea creatures, none of that. Only in Genesis chapter 1 says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. That's called in Latin, the Imago Dei. Only Christians have the imprint, have the Imago Dei in their hearts, in the image of God. God is the one that gives us value, meaning. We, we're rational beings. We're capable of loving. We're capable of caring for other human beings. We, we, we love. We embrace. That's all, that all comes from God. The Bible says, if anyone does not love, does not know God, because God is love. So when a person's in right relationship with God, the love of God is in their hearts. They have meaning in life, purpose, and they sense a true sense of value. Any other worldview outside of God, life is meaningless. If we just descended from animals, then we're not worth more than an animal or a dog or anything else. Only a God uh, philosophy, a, a, a God worldview gives meaning to life. The key verse in Lamentation, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassion never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And there's a great hymn that is called Great is Thy Faithfulness. And I encourage you to listen to it. Listen to what Je uh, Jeremiah is saying here in Lamentations. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Now, God could have consumed them and said, that's it. I'm done with you. Have it your way. And that's the worst thing that God can do to any human being is to allow them to go to their own way. And it says, for his compassion never failed. They are new every morning. Great is the faithfulness of God. God is faithful. Even though we mess up and we sin, God's faithfulness and God's love always tries to draw us back. He'll either send a Christian friend, a cousin, a co-worker, somebody to your path to try to bring you into a relationship with him. because. Human beings are lost without a relationship with God. Human beings have no purpose unless they're in relationship with God. We are created to be in relationship with God. And when we don't have that, we substitute God for all these other false gods, like materialism, cars, houses, even relationships. Some people see relationship and they idolize that. And they're trying to get from a relationship what only God can provide. A human being will always be miserable without God in their life because the Bible says that God has placed eternity in the hearts of men. Now think about that. Inside of us, there's an eternal soul that, that longs to connect to our eternal heavenly father. So nothing in this world, since everything's temporary, nothing in this world could satisfy that eternal longing that it lives inside of us. But when we come to God and we repent of our sins and turn to Christ, that longing is, is satisfied. In other words, we come back to our Heavenly Father. And then you realize this is the reason why I was born, to be in relationship with God. And then everything else in the world makes sense. Then everything else in the world has meaning and fulfillment because you have your ultimate fulfillment in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So God is merciful. He could have consumed them, but his great love goes after them and after them and after them. And then we go to the prophet Ezekiel. What is it about prophecy and warning? Where in Babylon, 593 to 571 BC, to confront people about their sin, to give them one last chance to repent and to offer hope. Again, God using prophets. One prophet dies, he raises up another prophet. That prophet dies, he raises up another prophet. Oh, God has always had a voice on the earth. Always, always, always. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 3, his calling, judgment of Judah, judgment of the nations. Because it wasn't only, you know, Israel and Judah that got judged. There were other nations. So there's prophecies about other nations that got judged, like the Babylonians and the Assyrians and uh, Egypt and all these other nations. They also got judged. So it's not like God judged his people and let the other nations fly and get away with what they were doing. No, their judgment was coming too if they didn't repent. So the prophets also spoke not only to Judah and Israel, but also to other nations. The end of the age, the restoration of the temple. 
the historical purpose of the prophet Ezekiel to warn the Jewish exiles living in Babylon that God was bringing judgment upon them for their sins. This judgment was necessary to turn them back to Lord and his law. And that's important, that phrase. This judgment was necessary to turn them back to the Lord and his law. Because when everything's going well, a lot of times we don't turn to God. When we're being disciplined by God and there's no other way to look, like with everything that's going on in our world, there's only one way to look right now and it's up. The government doesn't have the solution. The state doesn't have nobody. So the judgment, when God judges us and disciplines us, is always to turn us back to him. The prophet Jeremiah was at the same time warning the Jews who remain in Jerusalem that the city would soon fall to Babylon and be utterly destroyed. So you have Ezekiel prophesying in Babylon to the people that got exiled, and you have Jeremiah at the same time prophesying to the ones that remained in Jerusalem. God always speaking to his people. The Jews already, the, the Jews already exiled to Babylon, however, refused to believe that their beloved capital could fall. They falsely believed that they could soon return to Judah and that the nation would be restored. Ezekiel prophesied to these exiles that their sins would continue to be punished and that God must in this way purify his people. They have failed to repent. They have not turned back to God, not fully. In fact, they have begun adopting the pagan practices of Babylon. So even while they were in Babylon, they started adopting the pagan practices and what everybody else was doing. And God always wanted his people, the Jews at that time, to always live holy. And that word holy just basically means set apart from the things of this world, from sin and the world system and what everybody else is doing. That's what holy means. You live set apart for God. But they started, you know, practicing, you know, what the Babylonians were doing. And then the doctrinal spiritual purpose, at least five great doctrinal themes are found in the book of Ezekiel. The holiness and glory of God. That's what can we learn as we read Ezekiel. We learn about the holiness of God, how pure God is, you know, that he cannot tolerate sin. And that's why he had to send his son to be brutally crucified as a criminal because of sin. The most expensive thing in the world is sin. And the only thing that could have redeemed us from sin was innocent blood of the son of the living God. So as you understand the holiness of God, the less you will sin. So because some people see God as our buddy and we can do whatever we want and he'll just let us slide because he's just so loving and good. You need a, a to learn about the holiness of God, that that's who he is. He's pure, he's holy, and he wants us to be holy. The sinfulness and apostasy of Israel, the fact and purpose of God's judgment, the fact of individual responsibility. Now, that's important. We are all responsible for our own lives and for our own sins and the choices we make. I can't say, well, you know, I grew up in a home where my father and my mother didn't serve the Lord, so that's why I came out like this. That might have influenced me, but once you get to a certain age, you're 18, and you can make your own decisions, we're responsible for our own lives and the choices that we make. We can't blame it on uh, my mother, my father, my uncle, my niece, or my sister. We need to take responsibility for our own lives. The promise of Israel's future restoration also demonstrating God's faithfulness and mercy. And notice how that theme always comes up. In every major prophet is always judgment, the reason why you're being punished, and always the faithfulness of God and the mercy of God and future restoration, the Christological or Christ-centered purpose. Many references to Christ are found in Ezekiel. Ezekiel prophesied of the great hope that one day the true shepherd, the Messiah, will come to lead his people in righteousness. Now, again, this is before Christ came. So Ezekiel is prophesying that the true shepherd was going to come. And Jesus, when he came to the earth, what did he say? I am the true shepherd. And I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He said, no one takes my life from me. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. He did it out of his own accord, being obedient to the Father, because he wanted us to be in relationship with him. And that's what we have to understand, uh, people of God, that we were created for relationship with God. How many know that's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit? God lives in relationship. With, with the Son and the Holy Spirit. He's a relational God. And that's why Jesus came to die on the cross, to restore that relationship back that we had in the Garden of Eden before Adam sinned. And when Adam sinned, that relationship was severed, 
And now somebody had to pay the price for sin, and that somebody was Jesus Christ. And that's why in Romans chapter 5, Christ is referred to as the second Adam. The second Adam. Why? Because Jesus came to restore what we lost in the first Adam. Through the first Adam, we became disobedient and sinful. Through the second Adam, we received salvation and his righteousness and obedience. And it's a great study. If you, Roman, if you read Romans chapter 5, it gives you that contrast between the first Adam and the second Adam, which is Christ, to restore that relationship back that we have with God in the Garden of Eden. Although Israel's past and present leaders have oppressed them and turned them away from the Lord, they will be restored to the promised land by a righteous leader. In that great day, all the covenant blessings of the Lord will be completely fulfilled to God's people. Again, Ezekiel prophesying uh, of the, this righteous leader that's going to come, and he's going to restore Israel. Again, talking about the Messiah. The key verse in Ezekiel, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And that's what happens every single time a person turns to the Lord and asks God to forgive them for their sins and receives Christ in their life as the personal Lord and Savior. This is what happens spiritually. God gives them a new heart and a new spirit, which is the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. And he removes that heart of stone and gives you a heart of flesh, a tender heart, a heart that is loving, that now you can forgive your enemies. You can forgive you know, whatever your parents did to you when you were growing up. He gives you a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. Because before we gave our lives to Christ, many of us had a stony heart. You know, we might have done good deeds here and there, but in our hearts, we were self-centered. You know, we only cared about ourselves. You know, we hold grudges and unforgiveness and, and gossip and all these different things. So here Ezekiel's prophesying, when Jesus comes, this was going to happen. All who receive him, because this is not automatic, all who receive Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, a new heart and a new spirit, which is the Holy Spirit. The heart of stone will be removed, and he gives us a heart of flesh. And that is the powerful effect of salvation. And now we go to the fifth uh, major prophet, which is Daniel. Prophecy and apocalyptic visions. Where was he in Babylon? In 605 to 535 BC, to convince the Jewish exiles that God is sovereign and to provide them with a vision of their future redemption. Now, Daniel also got exiled into Babylon. You read Daniel chapter 1, they took him and his three friends. A lot of young men went to Babylon. But Daniel stood faithful to the Lord and God raised them up. And Daniel almost became like, like the governor over there in Babylon, serving you know the king of Babylon. Whenever the king of Babylon had dreams, Daniel was there to interpret the dreams. You know, not even his uh, astrologers and, and soothsayers and magicians could interpret the dream. And then they came, Daniel said, give me a couple of days, let me pray, and I'll tell you the dream and its interpretation, because that was the demand of the king. He said, look, if I tell these guys the dream, they're going to make up some interpretation. But if you're really real, you're going to tell me the dream and the interpretation. Only God was able to do that through Daniel. Daniel told them the dream and the interpretation. The other guys, his own people, the soothsayers and the magicians and those who practice uh, witchcraft, they were trying to be slick and tell us the dreams to buy time. But only Daniel was able to, to tell the interpretation and God raised up Daniel. And he became a governor over there in uh, Babylon, helping out the king and also prophesying, you know, and encouraging the exiles that were there that God is still in control. Daniel and his friends, chapter 1 through 6, apocalyptic visions that's about revelation and then daniel in the lines then you know they were so jealous of him all the other government officials they said look we can't find anything wrong with daniel but the only thing we can find with daniel has to be with his god so they went up to the king and said look make a put a, a a decree that no one can pray to their god for 30 days and sign it and whoever's caught praying to any god let that person be thrown into the den of lions these people were wicked but they were jealous of Daniel. And again, Daniel prayed three times a day. As soon as that law went, it went into effect, Daniel opened his window and started praying all over again. He wasn't going to stop praying after God had done so much for him and raised them up and given them these visions and, and, and prophecies. So they took Daniel through him in the lion's den, and the king couldn't sleep that whole night because he was worried for Daniel. But he already had signed it, so it looks bad if a king, you know, 
goes back on his word. So he had to put him in the lion's den. But early in the morning, the king went in. Daniel, are you there? And he says, I'm here. The God whom I serve delivered me from the lion's mouth. And the king was so happy and excited. He said, those men that accuse you, throw them in the lion's den. And as soon as they threw them in, the lions ripped them apart and, and ate them up. You know, so Daniel trusted in his God. You know, to be thrown to a lion's den and believe that God's going to deliver you in there, that takes a lot of faith. The historical purpose, to give comfort and encouragement to the Jewish exiles living in Babylon and in other nations where they have been deported. Just a generation prior to Daniel's, the northern kingdom of Israel had been conquered by the Assyrians and its inhabitants scattered. Similarly, in Daniel's generation, Babylon had, had conquered Judah. Daniel himself was deported to Babylon by decree of Nebuchadnezzar, along with the hundreds of other young Jewish men. Because of the suffering and persecution brought on by the exiles, the Jewish exiles were in sore need of hope. The prophecy of Daniel provided this hope. So there Daniel gets exiled, but he's also prophesying and giving them hope and reading the scriptures and saying, Jeremiah says it's only going to be 70 years. I'm waiting 70 years. You know, he's keeping that promise. So God used them. The doctrinal spiritual purpose. There's at least eight doctrinal spiritual purpose themes are found in the book of Daniel. The sovereignty, supreme rule, power, and authority of God. And that's important for us to know because, you know, Donald Trump is not in control. Any of these other nations are in control. God is in control. He's sovereign. He's supreme ruler. We see how he took Nebuchadnezzar, you know, and, and he used them to judge Judah. But then at the end, he used Nebuchadnezzar to raise up Daniel. And Nebuchadnezzar one time got so prideful that he said, look, I've created this whole Babylonian empire and all that. And before the words left his mouth, he was living, you know, in the grass. And his nails became long like claws. He became insane for a season. And then he said, my reason became to me, came to me, and I understood that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men. You know, so... Nebuchadnezzar had a humbling experience. God is sovereign. And if you get that in your heart and in your spirit, realizing that God is in control, no matter what happens, you will not fear, you will not fret, and your trust will not be on the, on the other nations or what's going on around us. The sinfulness and rebellion of the human race. So that's what you learn when you read the, the book of Daniel. The reality of spiritual warfare and the power of prayer. Daniel prays throughout that time. The truth and accuracy of God's holy word which includes true prophecy, the accurate prediction of the future. And again, exactly 70 years, they send them back to their land. Another king comes up, uh, King Xerxes, you know, the, the king of Persia, and he sends them back. He says, look, you know, I'm led to say that the Lord said to go back and, and build the temple. No, that's God reigning in the kingdom of men. The prediction of the great tribulation, the resurrection of the dead, the ultimate triumph of God's kingdom over the kingdoms of the world and all the forces of evil. And the Christological or Christ-centered purpose, Christ is the most holy and anointed one, or Messiah, the prince, in the King James Version, anointed to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, and to bring everlasting righteousness to earth. The years of Christ's ministry and death are prophesied in Daniel's vision of 70 weeks. And that's a powerful prophecy, exactly Jesus' ministry and, and when he's going to die and everything to the T is predicted in the book of Daniel. Christ also makes several pre-incarnate appearances, appearances before his earthly birth. Christ is very likely. So uh, an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament is called a Christophany. Now we have to understand that Christ always existed. It says in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Christ the, 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 the eternal Son of God always existed. The human being, Christ, was born about 2,000 years ago, but the, the Christ, the, the, the divine God, always existed in Christ. So we see him appearing in the Old Testament, which is called the Christophany. And we see that in the book of Daniel. The man clothed in linen in Daniel's vision at the Tigris River in chapter 12. Daniel has this vision, and he sees a man there dressed in fine linen and all that. That's a Christophany, an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. The fourth man in the fiery furnace with Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and having the form of the Son of God. Now, these three Hebrew children, they said, we're not going to bow down to this statue that King Nebuchadnezzar set up. If we're thrown into the fiery furnace, they said, our God is able to deliver us, but we're not going to bow down to this huge statue. So they took those three uh, Hebrew boys, 
threw him in the fiery furnace, waiting for them to die and burn up. And the king said, wait a minute. Then I throw three people in there, but I see four. And one is like the son of man. And they, were, they came out of that fiery furnace unharmed. So that's a Christophany, Christ appearing in the Old Testament in all his glory and splendor because Christ has always existed. That's why John the Baptist said, he who comes after me is before me because he existed before me. Talking about the pre-existent Christ. He's always lived with the Father from all eternity. He just took on human flesh and died on the cross. But the Christ, the Son of God, always existed. The Son of Man who approaches the Ancient of Days and whose dominion endures forever. That's in Daniel chapter 7. The Son of Man come and approaches the Ancients of Days, which is God. You know, he's called the Ancients of Days because his years never fail. He's been existing from everlasting to everlasting. And that's something that we can grasp because we're finite beings. And our uh, since we're finite, we can't really fully comprehend an infinite God. We don't know what it is to live outside of time, outside of space. Like right now we're here. It's maybe going to be 8 o'clock. I'm not looking at a time right now. And we're waiting for tomorrow. But God is already in tomorrow. You understand? That's hard to grasp because he doesn't live in time. We got to wait for tomorrow to come, 24 hours, and then a new day comes up. God is already in tomorrow. He, he lives for all eternity. There's no such thing with time. Time is only for human beings. And then the key verse in Daniel, it says, in the times of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end. But it, but it itself will last, endure forever. That's the kingdom of God will endure forever. It will never end. God is in control. God is in charge. His plan will come into fruition. There's nothing that man can do that can frustrate the plan of God. And that's what we have to understand church so we're gonna leave it there and then we're gonna open it up now for questions and answers